Hello everyone, my name is Sara Ghassemi. I have a good news for you. I have made a series of the videos for chapter 5 membrane. As you may know, this chapter has many interesting topics. It is also a little challenging for some of the students. I have tried to explain everything as simple as possible, but still you need to review and watch these videos as much as you need so if you find this video helpful and uh, make sure to subscribe to my channel so by the time you will take further biology courses like anatomy and physiology or microbiology or any entrance uh, exams uh, like pcat mcat you can access to these videos this video is part one and the links for the rest of the videos have been uh, posted in description so now objectives for this video uh, we will go over the structure of the plasma membrane and also we will cover the, its function and the fluidity of the membrane selective permeability of the membrane uh, passive transports such as diffusion and facilitated diffusion and the last thing that we will cover in this video is active transports and also there is a demonstration at the end of this video I don't miss it so let's start as you recall from chapter 4 the plasma membrane is the barrier that separates interior of the cell from outside it controls which molecules should get into the cell or leave the cell I want to talk about the structure of the plasma membrane. As you have learned in chapter 4, the main component of the plasma membrane is the phospholipid. And the phospholipid has a polar head and hydrophobic tails. So these are the phospholipids. The plasma membrane is made of the bio-layer and you will find out why. Also, the accepted model for the plasma membrane is called fluid mosaic model that means there are some components such as cholesterol glycolipid glycoproteins or transmembrane proteins that are embedded in the fluid bio-layer of phospholipid so this slide shows the structure of the phospholipid I expect you to know the structure of this molecule from chapter 3. So as you see here, it has a polar head because it has a phosphate group, it has a negative charges, and also it has two fatty acids. Fatty acid tails, as you see here, is made of the carbon and hydrogen atoms. And because electronegativity differences between carbon and hydrogen is very small we consider this hydrophobic so phospholipid the name is made of the polar head that is hydrophilic and hydrophobic tails so this kind of the substances called an amphipathic like a soap like a detergent detergents for example if you have a greasy plate you cannot clean it just by rinsing water you need to add detergent detergent that you use has the two parts it has hydrophilic head and also hydrophobic part because of a structure of the phospholipid molecules they can form the bio layer this picture guys this is amazing this is real picture that is taken by transmission electron microscope or TEM as you see here it has two layers so outside of the cell the main solvent is water you also have water inside of the cell the heads of the phospholipids are exposing to water inside and outside of the cell this causes hydrophobic region the tails of the phospholipids to stay away from water as a result, phospholipids form a bio-layer membrane. This shows the bio-layer structure. As you see here, inside of this bio-layer 
is non-polar hydrophobic tails and you have polar hydrophilic heads. There are some uh, membrane proteins as I mentioned here and you need to know these functions of these membrane proteins. Some of them they have a, a structural function because uh, animal cells don't have a cell wall. These proteins allow cells to attach to these extracellular matrix. Some of the proteins, membrane proteins, they work as a, an enzyme. For example, this figure uh, shows the cross structure of a small intestine. You know, it's made of several cells and these transmembrane protein in these cells are able to release the enzymes that is called uh, amino peptidase that can catalyze the cleavage of the amino acids from dipeptide or polypeptide. So, for example, if this is dipeptide, uh, these enzymes can break it down into two amino acids. There are some transmembrane proteins that they work as a transporter and we will get to this one later. There are some uh, membrane proteins that they work like as a receptors and also signal transduction. So this chapter is very interesting. As you see here, biolayers are fluid individual. So for example, if we use the red fluorescent dye and label one of the phospholipid here, you cannot locate it at the same place later. That's why we say plasma membranes are a dynamic fluid membrane. And as you know, our uh, body is made of uh, more than 100 trillion cells. And there are a lot of things going on in our body, such as enzymatic or chemical reactions, uh, movement of the molecules take place in our body. So some of them we can feel it, such as inhaling oxygen molecules and exhaling carbon dioxide, but most of them are not noticeable. This one reminds me the rotation of the earth. It is happening, but we don't feel it. This is just an analogy example. There are some factors that uh, determine the fluidity of the membrane and I'm going to discuss uh, two of them in this video. One of them is cholesterol. You remember from chapter 3 that cholesterol is the lipid. So that means hydrophobic. So it makes the hydrophobic bonds with the fatty acid tails of the phospholipids. So when temperature increases, molecules want to get separated from each other. If you have molecules, they want to stay away from each other. But cholesterol makes the bond, weak hydrophobic bond with these fatty acid tails and restrain the movement of the phospholipids. On the other hand, when temperature drops, molecules want to be close to each other. But again, because cholesterol is the big molecule, it won't allow tight packing of the phospholipids. This is another thing that is very interesting. Another factor that determines fluidity of the membrane is the ratio of saturated and unsaturated fatty acid tails in the phospholipids. You remember from chapter 3, saturated fatty acid don't have double bond, so it forms the straight shape. Uh, on the other hand, when there is a double a covalent bond between two carbons so it forms the kink or bend in the fatty acid so it won't allow tight packing of the phospholipids if there are more unsaturated fatty acids in the membrane you know as i mentioned a structure determines the functions evolutionary adapted to extreme temperatures uh, for example, Antarctic fish or ice fish exhibit an evolutionary response to extreme cold temperature by having high level of unsaturated fatty acid in their membranes.
semi-permeable or selectively permeable it allows some molecules to go through their membrane based on their concentration sizes or charges plasma membrane in biological membranes are selectively permeable and i like to share this uh, slide with you let's uh, start with the gases like carbon dioxide oxygen molecules can go directly through the membrane an example of this one if this is the lung you have air sac here so this air sac because you inhale the oxygen so you expect to have accumulated oxygen molecules inside of the air sac and also you have blood vessels here so because you have more oxygen here they diffuse it inside of the blood vessels and accumulated carbon dioxide diffuses to the inside of the air sac so these molecules are non-polar so they can go easily through the membrane for water molecule we have two ways it can go directly through the membrane as you see here and also it can go through the plasma membrane proteins it's called an acroporin I will write it down again here, acroporins. So it has two ways to get water in or out of the cells. For ions, anything that it has charges, they cannot go through the membrane directly. Why? As I mentioned here, middle of this membrane, you have a hydrophobic layer. So it won't allow these molecules to go through the membrane. But Thankfully, we have some proteins here that allow these ions to go through the membrane. So ions can go through the protein channels. And for large molecules like glucose, amino acids, also we have some transmembrane proteins that you will learn how they will transport these molecules such as glucose into the cell. So now we want to learn this uh, process, passive transport versus active transport. As you see here, there are two kinds of the passive transport. Uh, one of them is the diffusion and another one is facilitated diffusion or facilitated transport. In passive transport, uh, molecules and move down their concentration gradient in simple diffusion because as i mentioned earlier a small and non-polar molecules can pass through the membrane directly like oxygen and carbon dioxide molecules now we are gonna find out how polar molecules or ions can pass through the membrane thankfully we do have some transmembrane proteins um, embedded in plasma membrane. So if these transmembrane proteins move the solutes or substances down their concentration gradient, the name of the process is called facilitated diffusion. Uh, the first one is called a protein channel. These channels have a hydrophilic interior regions that allow a small polar molecules or ions pass through the membrane. So if this protein channel just transports the ions, it's called an ion channel. Example of the protein channels, as I mentioned earlier, is an ecoporin. Now we are going to talk about another transmembrane protein that is called protein carriers. An example of the protein carriers is glucose transporters. So protein carriers bind to the specific molecules. Take a look. It binds to the specific molecule and drag it to the inside of the cell. In diffusion or facilitated diffusion, because molecules move down their concentration gradients is no required energy. So on the other hand, in active transport, you have carrier proteins, you have transmembrane proteins here, but we are gonna send 
molecules from low concentration to the region with higher concentration. So in an active transport, in order to transport molecules against their concentration gradient, the cell will need to expend energy by hydrolyzing ATP molecule. In this example that you see here, is actually is the primary active transport. I will discuss about secondary active transport later. An example of the an active transport is the sodium and potassium pump. So imagine we have two buses here. So I will call this one bus A and this is bus B. The, each bus has a capacity of 20 people. So you have 20 seats inside of these two buses. In bus A, imagine you have 30 people, more than their capacity. And in bus B, you have only two people. So what do you think? If you are in bus A, you prefer to stay in this bus, the bus B, that you can have a seat and is less crowded. So you prefer a person that is in bus A goes to the area that is less crowded. So when you have more substances or high concentration area, molecules want to go to the area that is less crowded and is not required energy. If you ask this person to go and sit here, he doesn't need to use a lot of energy to find a space here. So is no required energy. When molecules, they go down their concentration gradient or they go from high to low concentration area. But let me change the color. Now imagine you are here. If I ask you to move and find a place in bus A, do you like to go? Can you easily find a space in bus A? No, because the bus is already overloaded. If you want to find a space here, you need to spend energy. So, when molecules go from low concentration to high concentration area, so it's required energy or ATP. Which one happens spontaneously? So whenever you study diffusion, facilitated diffusion, or active transport, make sure to remember this example. In simple diffusion, as long as you increase the concentration gradient, the transport rate also would increase. But in facilitated diffusion, in the beginning, the transport rate would increase, and then it would stay constant and I want to explain to you why this is happening. So for example when we eat mashed potato that is full of the starch, this starch molecule goes through a long digestive process and eventually convert into a glucose molecules. Imagine this is a cell and we have six a protein carriers here and there are 10 glucose molecules outside of the cell that we want to send them inside of the cell so because of the limited number of the protein carriers we can just send six glucose inside of the cell at a time that means these four glucose molecules should wait until all these six molecules get inside of the cell and then they can go and make a bond with protein carriers and get inside of the cell. That's why in the facilitated diffusion, the transport rate will increase first and then it will stay constant as the concentration gradient increases. and solvent. 
is the substances dissolved in the solvent we call it solute. The solution in which the solute is dissolved we call it solvent. For example, when you make a tea, the water is your solvent and tea is going to be your solute. Both together that they are mixed we call it a solution. When you have a sucrose 10%, that means 10% of the solution is solute or sucrose and 90% is solvent. And whenever you work with solution that doesn't indicate the name of the solvent, you should assume that the solvent is water. I want to show you the simple diffusion and this is water that I put it into the beaker. Now I'm going to add a few drops of the neutral red. So the neutral red molecules are moving or diffusing from high concentration from this area to area that it's less concentrated. In other words, we can say molecules, they move down their concentration gradient until they reach equilibrium. Actually, it's a dynamic equilibrium. Uh, I will check again later to see what will it happen if you wait more. So this is the result of the simple diffusion of neutral red in water uh, after 30 minutes. And as you see here, the beaker solution turned into the light red color. So that means all neutral red molecules are evenly spread through of the solution. You know, they reach their equilibrium. And thank you for watching this video. And also make sure to watch the chapter 5 part 2 video.